Perfect. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, we'll continue our discussion on gradient descent method, but I'm going to put a new spin today. Uh, the new spin is basically a bunch of algorithms that were discovered in 1960s, 80s, early 2010, uh, all of which kind of uh, extends the idea of quasi-Newton's method and comes up with completely different class of algorithms that solves uh, unconstrained optimization problems. Uh, the only difference is now we will expect the functions to be convex. So I want to minimize f of x, x is in Rn, and f is convex, f is strongly convex. And mi is less than equal to second derivative for all x. <clears throat> so small m times identity matrix is less than equal to the second derivative of f at x, which is less than equal to capital M of i. So small m is basically the smallest eigenvalue of the second derivative and capital M is the largest eigenvalue of the second derivative. So this is the way to write it. And remember that steepest descent algorithm is xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha k gradient of fxk. So the idea in uh, the quasi-Newton method was, well, I'm computing gradient of fx0, I'm computing gradient of fx1, I'm computing gradient of fx2 all the way to fxk. Uh, but so the question there was, can we use this information to compute the second derivative inverse or some approximation of second derivative inverse in order to get the benefits of Newton's method, get the faster convergence rate of the Newton's method? Uh, in today's lecture, the idea is somewhat similar, but instead of trying to compute second derivative inverse, we want to just figure out if there is a way to speed up the convergence, uh, get a better convergence than steepest descent, get a faster convergence than steepest descent by some manipulations of the first derivative. So the idea is, So we compute gradient of fx0, gradient of fxk, but discard gradient of fx0 to gradient of fxk minus 1 for computing decay. Can we do better? Can we get faster convergence by using this information? So let's give you an example of what I mean by this goal. Not something that we will be doing today, 
but basically the idea is can I get fx xk plus 1 equals to xk plus summation of beta k i, i goes from 0 to k gradient fx i. Okay, let's say this is the problem. So we want, we are discarding all this information, but let's not discard this information. Let's try to use it. So one way and simplest way to use it is, I want to take the linear combination of all the gradients I've computed so far, figure out what this value of beta ki should be, and then compute xk plus one accordingly, right? So that could be, that's a very reasonable requirement. So I'm discarding all this information. Maybe I don't want to compute second derivative inverse. Uh, I don't want to use quasi-Newton method, but can we do better uh, by just taking a linear combination? So these were the ideas back in 1960s, people were people were thinking about it back in 1960s that I don't want to discard all this idea, all, all these vectors that I've computed. Remember in 1960s, computers weren't that powerful. So everybody wanted to get the maximum juice out of all the gradients that they have computed. And, and uh, that was the reason why people were studying algorithms of this type. So second derivative was difficult. Second derivative inverse was difficult. But if you're computing the first derivatives, you might as well use it in some weird fashion to be able to better, uh, to Im in order to improve the performance of the steepest descent. So here is the idea uh, that uh, I am getting from this particular book. So introductory lectures on convex optimization. You can download the PDF uh, as long as you are on university Wi-Fi. So you can download the PDF. And what I'm going to discuss today is written page 71 onward with a completely different notation. So, <laughs> uh, so it's very difficult to parse through the notation of that book in comparison to what we have been using so far. So that's why I've changed the notation to what we are using in the class. But if you go back to that reference, you might have some difficulty trying to understand what notation the author is using. Anyways, uh, with that caveat, I want to talk about uh, a definition a sequence of functions r into r is called an estimate sequence of f from r into r if and only if 1 lambda k goes to 0 as k goes to infinity and 2 And what is the property of this uh, estimate sequence?
Okay, so I'll let you guys write it and then we'll explain. Okay. Right. So you have like a sequence x x zero x one x two x three oh, all the way to the first, uh, first this one. Yeah, 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 second one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. This infinite lambda k to infinite. Right. So uh, lambda k is a sequence. It's a sequence, and it's non-negative. And it goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay. So this is this is a sequence. So you have a sequence of function, and you have a sequence of uh, scalars, non-negative scalars. Remember, lambda k is an R, so it's a non-negative scalar. Lambda k is going to zero as k goes to infinity. So something like one over k. You know, so one over k is non-negative, but it goes to zero as k goes to infinity. And then phi k of x is less than equal to uh, some function multiplied by the scalar plus phi naught of x times lambda k. And this has to be true for all k and true for all x in Rn. Okay, so they were thinking about it. So this is like a 20, 30 years of development before which they could come up with this theory. So, uh, so it has a very long history, but I'm not going to tell you about the entire history. We are just talking about the key results. So they came up with this estimate sequence. And then this estimate sequence has a very desirable property that if you construct a sequence x1 to x infinity, which satisfies this condition, then fxk minus f of x star is less than or equal to lambda k multiplied by phi naught of at x star and f of x star. Now, phi naught of x star will be some finite value. f of x star is, x star is of course the optimal solution. x star is the argument here. It's the minimum value, minimum point at which, the point at which the minimum value is attained. So what is happening here? Uh, this term is a finite value. Lambda k is going to 0 as k goes to infinity. So this term, and remember f of x star is the smallest value. So this term is non-negative. So this non-negative term is less than or equal to a term that's going to 0. What does that mean? This term is going to 0. Right, And this term is going to 0 means x of xk is converging to x star. Or xk is converging to a minimum uh, value which is going to attain its minimum. The function is going to attain the minimum at that particular point. So that is the idea behind coming up with this theory. Now what this gives us is if you can pick some appropriate phi naught and appropriate lambda k, so that this equation is satisfied, then you have a whole bunch of algorithm. All you can do is try to minimize this, this particular function. Hopefully this is easier to minimize, so you can minimize this particular function, and you get a sequence xk which will satisfy this condition, and then you know that it is going to converge to the optimal solution. So for different construction of this lambda k and phi k, they were able to derive a whole bunch of algorithms, which is what uh, we'll be talking about now. But any questions so far before I jump to the algorithm? Uh, let's see an example of an estimate sequence. So remember, we were talking about using gradient of fx0 to fxk. So this estimate sequence is going to use all that information of the gradient in order to compute, in order to come up with a faster algorithm. So phi zero arbitrarily picked.
I have summation of beta k equals to infinity, beta k lies in 0, 1, lambda naught is equal to 1, and I will pick lambda k plus 1 equals to 1 minus and p k plus 1 equals to I think I'll be able to write it. Uh, oh, yk is also an arbitrary sequence. It's not important for you to write it down uh, because these are examples that I'm just, uh, I just want to discuss in class, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of estimate sequence they constructed from the function. So see, the function is appearing here. And remember, phi k of x contains all the gradients that were computed in the past. And this one contains the gradient that you might be computing at this particular time step. So the construction of phi k plus 1 actually contains all the gradients that you have computed so far. Uh, this m is the small m here. And you can pick beta k according to some fashion that might be desirable. Uh, lambda naught starts with 1. And summation of beta k must be equal to infinity. So beta k should not go to 0 very fast. It should go to 0 slowly if you're taking a sequence that is going to zero, or it can be constant. That's completely fine. So, uh, so if you pick, uh, so, so this is how you construct an estimate sequence. So this way of constructing lambda k and phi k, you get a, uh, you can show that this is actually an estimate sequence for the function f, and therefore this particular condition is satisfied by this sequence of lambda k and phi k. The other interesting thing here is uh, if you pick phi naught to be just a quadratic function, then each of these phi k will also be a quadratic function. Because this is a quadratic function, you have an affine, and then you have a quadratic function here. So overall, you will get a quadratic function at all points of time. So that is how they came up with a bunch of algorithms. And now I'm going to talk about two specific algorithms that are very widely used and studied in the optimization literature. So let's look at what those algorithms are. Any question? Uh, does a beta k, could it be one? Does um, you're getting all zeros? No, you don't want, you don't want, you want lambda k to go to zero slowly. You don't want it to go to zero immediately. So lambda k needs to go to zero as k goes to infinity. Uh, so we just don't choose uh, uh, no, you don't want to pick beta k to be equal to 1. Yeah. But you want summation of beta k to be infinity. So you can take like 1 half or whatever so works for you. Would that be the change? Sorry? For that, for that, uh, for that beta k, mm -hmm. that is uh, from beta k to 1? I mean, you know, I picked it up from the book, but definitely you can keep it like this. Yeah. You don't want it to be greater than 1 for sure, otherwise lambda k will become negative. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Any other question? Yes. Excuse me? M? This M is this M. OK, smallest eigenvalue of the second derivative of the function f. Any other question? Yes. Can you remind me again how you got from, because we started with uh, 5, 0, and now we're at 5k and k plus 1. Uh, right. So you want to construct phi of k 
in a manner that satisfies this particular inequality. So that this way of constructing phi k will satisfy this inequality. You can go and read the derivation here in this book. Okay, I don't want to cover the derivation in the class. All I'm saying is there are, all you need is these two conditions to be true because this fact will then come to rescue you. Now, if these two conditions are true, so how do you construct sequences that these two conditions are true? This is one way of constructing it. You can go to sleep tonight and maybe tomorrow morning you will have another way of constructing lambda k and phi k and you can design your own algorithm for solving optimization problems. Because you can construct the sequence xk by just minimizing phi k. And then you know that it's going to uh, converge to the optimal solution. <coughs> okay, any other question? Awesome. So there are th these two uh, important algorithms. Nested of momentum method. If I'm not mistaken, this is from 1984, but I may be wrong with the dates a little bit. But somewhere in 1980s, this method was uh, designed using this uh, estimate sequence idea. Zk equals to yk plus beta k y k minus y k minus 1 Polyak momentum. Nestor of accelerated gradient, sorry, not momentum, but accelerated gradient. Polyak momentum. method. You can think of z of k as x of k, like the iterate that you want to compute. But this is a two-step process. So you need to compute z of k, then you need to compute y of k plus 1, then you compute zk plus 1, then you compute yk plus 2, and so on. Here, you can compute xk directly. Oh, there is yk minus yk minus 1. Oh, I think this is xk minus xk minus 1. That's right. Okay. So by picking an appropriate lambda k and phi k plus 1, you can get these two methods. Okay, and the derivation of the two methods is given in this book, so you can go and see how they derived. Starting from this estimate sequence, to this particular result, to these algorithms. So it's all given in the book. I think from page 71 to page 79 or page 80, so it's like 10 pages of material which derives all these methods. 
the attractive thing about these two methods is, uh, so let's see, let's see what's happening. So in this method, we need to store another vector, right? So zk is what my xk is going to be. So zk should converge to x star. But in this particular case, you need to store this another intermediate vector, yk, uh, in addition to, uh, in addition to uh, storing zk. So again, not a very high complexity algorithm, somewhat easy to implement. Uh, but at the same, but, but, but it is faster than steepest descent. This algorithm, these two algorithms are strictly faster than steepest descent. So keep that in mind. However, uh, and you will implement these algorithms in the next assignment, in assignment three. So you will actually see it in action, wherein these algorithms will be faster than steepest descent. Uh, uh, but the, there, is, uh, there is some memory complexity here, but there is absolutely zero memory complexity in this algorithm. Like this is literally just doing what you generally do uh, uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, like you're just adding additional term in the usual steepest descent and this seems to Im improve the convergence speed and you converge to the optimal solution fairly quickly in comparison to the steepest descent. So Nesterov, so this, this of course, uh, this idea came from 1963. Again, don't quote me on the dates, but roughly it gives you the idea of the decade. So this was the first, uh, the first algorithm, and then Nesterov made it uh, uh, under an umbrella of this estimate sequence. And then he came up with his own algorithm of accelerated gradient method. Both of them are very fast in comparison to steepest descent. <clears throat> Any question? Yes. I have two questions. Yes. Um, one clarification question is that y and z, those are the two sequences on which the function f and y axis? No. Uh, well, Maybe in the derivation, that's what happens. But in reality, zk is the same as xk. So you, this is the one that you are tracking. And zk should converge to x star. Now you will notice that at optimal solution, if zk is x star, then y is also x star. So both zk and yk, both of these sequences will converge to x star eventually. Oh, that's a very uh, long question. Uh, sorry, the question is short, but the answer is very long. Uh, so you have to go through this. Uh, if you want to know why, what makes it faster, I think you have to go through the book. Uh, the easiest way to see that is by picking a quadratic function, x transpose. So just pick f of x equals to x transpose q half of x transpose qx, you know that the optimal solution is x star equals to zero. And you know that you can put all the gradients are supposed to be just q of x. So you can substitute gradient q of x, gradient here as q of x. And then you can analyze the dynamical behavior of this. Let's do that. Why not do that? Everyone wants to do that? You want to know how, why these algorithms are faster? OK, let's do that. Why not? Uh, so we'll do it for x transpose qx, because everything is easy to compute. These are faster than the other methods, but only Steepest descent. Yeah, but only if the uh, function is convex. Oh, that's another big question. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, the, in, so theoretically, the function has to be strongly convex. In reality, none of the functions that you will use will be strongly convex, right? You can still apply these methods. They'll still converge to some solution. But, and those solutions will be good solutions, but you don't know whether those are optimal solutions or not. So there are two parts, right? So people who design algorithms, they want to prove that it converges to the optimal solution. And in order to prove that they converge to optimal solution, they have to make the strongly convex assumption. But people who are practitioners, they don't care about it's converging to optimal solution or not. They care about it's converging to something that is useful. So in reality, it converges to something that is useful. In theory, 
it's applied to strongly convex function and then it converges to the optimal solution. But still if it's not a strongly convex, <coughs> this method is faster. Yeah, you can apply it to neural network training as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But it's still necessarily faster than steepest itself. Nobody can prove it, okay. but nobody can disprove it either, right? So for convex, you know that these are faster. These are guaranteed to be faster than steepest descent. And the proof is there in that book. So let's look at uh, the long answer to the short question by assuming that f of x is x transpose qx. <coughs> Let's take the energy. Okay. So I have ZK equals to, I'm also going to take all these step sizes as constant, beta K, alpha, alpha K, beta K, all of these will be constant just to make my life easy. Right? So this is now I need to compute. ZK plus one. I need to fill in this matrix. YK plus one equals to I minus alpha Q and then zero. I think this is correct. What about ZK plus one? No, there is some problem. Oh, I know what I can do. This is going to take some time, but I'm sure we will emerge victorious at the end of the class. So I need to make sure I collect the correct terms on both sides. So it seems to me that ZK comprises of uh, so if I put ZK plus one and YK plus one, I need to keep track of YK plus one and YK. That makes it difficult. So I'll put ZK here. Very good point. <laughs> okay, so what's your suggestion? I pick ZK plus one and YK plus one here, and then ZK plus one is supposed to be one plus beta 
yk plus 1. Oh, yes, 1 plus beta i minus alpha q zk minus beta yk. Perfect. So I have 1 plus beta i minus alpha q minus beta i. Am I correct? This is right, right? 1 plus beta i minus alpha q z k. This is fine. And let's look at steepest descent. x k plus 1 equals to i minus alpha q x k. OK. So I have, I have only one parameter alpha to play with. And if I pick an appropriate value of alpha, I can adjust the eigenvalue of this matrix. So what's the convergence speed of xk plus 1? Anyone knows? It's lambda max. So the convergence speed, so if lambda max of i minus alpha q is high, then convergence is slow. Right? All of you agree with this? So if my eigenvalues of this matrix is large, then the convergence is going to be slow. If it is small, then the convergence is going to be fast. So all you have to do is pick an appropriate value of beta and alpha for this particular matrix so that the eigenvalue, so lambda max, should be strictly less than lambda max of i minus alpha q. So you have two parameters to pick, beta and alpha. And by appropriately picking beta and alpha, you can ensure that the lambda max here is smaller. This is Nestorov accelerated gradient method. So we'll do the Polyak method right after that. This is this method, the one that I'm talking about there. Oh, okay. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. OK, so this is my steepest descent. This is Nesterov accelerated gradient. I need to do the same thing for Polyak momentum method. But before I do that, before I move on to Polyak momentum, everybody understand this concept. If the lambda max is high, then the convergence is slow, OK? Because uh, the convergence of this sequence to 0, remember, this thing has to converge to x star equals to 0. So this sequence will converge to 0 based on how high the eigenvalue of this particular matrix is. OK, now let's look at Polyak momentum method. What's happening here? How do you sure we can have like uh, certain alpha and beta make that yeah, so uh, that's again another linear algebra problem. But here is one value of alpha and beta you can pick. Alpha equals to 1 over m. Beta equals to square root of m minus So if you pick alpha, alpha equals to this and beta equals to this, and if your Q satisfies this condition, then you can show that this condition is satisfied. <clears throat> so it's all something that you know people have thought about for a long time, and they've figured out what the best alpha and beta is. Just requires a little bit of practice with these kind of questions to figure out what is good alpha and what is not. <clears throat> And now let's look at Polyak. Uh, 
I have x k plus 1 x k. So, this is i 0. Did I make any mistake? <clears throat> uh, no, this is separate. So, so there is there is x k plus beta k x k. So, what I have done is I have added one plus beta times i times x k and then minus alpha q x k. Yeah, this one appear separately. OK, again, you have two parameters, alpha and beta, to play with. And if you, play, if you pick the right value of alpha and beta, you can make sure that the largest eigenvalue of this particular matrix, remember, it's not a symmetric matrix. This is also not a symmetric matrix. OK? But by picking appropriate value of alpha and beta, you can make sure that the eigenvalue of this matrix, the largest eigenvalue, or the spectral radius of this matrix is smaller than the spectral radius of this matrix for the best alpha you can pick here. <clears throat> and so because you can change the spectral radius of these matrices, you end up getting a faster convergence speed. As a result of which, these results are provably faster than the gradient descent algorithm, especially for convex problems of when f is strongly convex and satisfies these conditions. Does that answer your question? Right. So, okay. Intuitive, intuitively what you are doing. Okay. So, so this is my function. And I'm standing here at xk. And I need to get to the next point, xk plus 1. So in momentum method, this is what your gradient descent is going to be. And then you add a term, which is you're moving in the direction of the previous direction. So this is my dk minus 1. So I'm, I'm trying to slide a little bit more. So I'm going to do a descent, but then I'm going to slide a little bit more towards the direction in which I, I went in the previous time step. So this would be my this would be my gradient descent step, this one, but I'm going to slide a little bit more based on the previous time steps descent direction. But how much? By how much? Well, beta has to be tuned accordingly to figure out how much you should slide. So this is the momentum method. Uh, same thing is happening in Nestoro, but it's happening in a somewhat weird fashion, because remember, this zk is actually this term. So you are sliding in the direction and then computing the gradient, rather than computing the gradient first and then sliding. So the question is, when should you slide? Should you slide before computing the gradient or after computing the gradient? So in the Nestorov accelerated gradient, you first slide, and then you take the gradient. In Polyak momentum method, you first take the gradient, then you slide. That's roughly what the intuitive difference is. But you're sliding in the previous direction. Like whatever direction you picked in the previous time step, you just want to take a small step in that direction. Correct. Sliding will always get you. The only problem happens is closer to the optimal solution where the sliding will take you away from the optimal point. So if you're standing here, you might slide to this point, and then you might slide back to this point. So closer to the optimal solution, there is a little bit of ripples that are uh, created. Uh, but even with those ripples, it's still faster. You, know, you get to the optimal solution much faster. <clears throat> so when I give you the assignment, 
you will see these ripples getting formed during the optimization process. Uh, so you will see it in action. In the cur yeah, exactly. So if you plot the error graph, you will see something like something like this. So the error is going to zero, but you will see some ripples in the error because of this behavior. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so there are no further questions. I'll uh, talk about two more methods. One is Adagrad and Ada Delta. Uh, these methods are from 2009, 2009, 2010 onwards. Uh, let's talk about it. I mean, uh, you know, B0, B0 is basically B minus 1 square plus something, something. So that's why I've kept B minus 1. Okay, so in this case, you're not looking at, uh, you're not look using the previous gradient to, let me, let me expand it a little further, so that way you see where the previous gradients are coming. Right. So you see all the previous gradient, you take the norm of the previous gradients that you have computed, take the norm, sum it up, add the b minus 1 square term, take the square root, you get bk, that bk appears in the denominator here. So as the gradient of fx fxk goes to zero, this particular term converges to a, to a steady state value, and then that steady state value appears in the denominator here. Is that this subscript, so k minus one or b minus one? b minus one, uh, so b minus one is, remember that b zero, when you compute b zero, then you need to have b minus one square plus gradient of fx naught square. So this is just b minus 1. b minus 1 is like the initial value. Any other question? I think that is i equals 0. Oh, i equals 0. Yeah, that's right. Any other question? So i goes from 0 to k. So you're looking at all the past gradient, taking the norm, adding it up, taking the square root, that appears in the denominator here. So you're still using the previous gradient to speed up the, the gradient descent process. 
And you know, a lot of the convergence analysis has been done in the past seven or so years of these algorithms. Well, a lot of people have studied a lot of things about these algorithms. So I think a book will come out in 2030, and that book will contain a sort of comprehensive treatment of all these different algorithms. Uh, that book is not written yet. So all of these things are in paper. So this is like 2009, maybe, or 10. And this would be 2013, 13-ish, 12 or 13. I don't know. So something, something from that era, so not too long ago. And ADA delta is bk square equals to bk minus 1, 1 minus beta. So epsilon is some small positive value. Oh, bk minus 1 square. Yeah. So this BK again appears here. So here we were taking average, uh, not average, but we are taking summation. Here we are using some sort of discounting and using uh, using discounting to like keep the recent give more weight to the recent iterates give less weight to the previous iterates and that's how you are computing the descent direction <coughs> okay so these are all the like all the four methods we talked about nesterov accelerated gradient poliak momentum method ada grade and ada delta and then newer variations of these two, these two algorithms, they're all basically faster, or either they are faster than steepest descent, or they are more stable than steepest descent, or they, are, uh, much they have much better properties than steepest descent if you have like very large data set, very high dimensions, all of those things. So that's why these methods are, uh, like if, you're, if you go to Google or Facebook, it's quite likely that you will be using one of these methods. Not, the, not these two, but one of these methods for uh, doing some sort of training or gradient descent or whatever optimization problems they solve, especially because they are looking at very high dimensional, high dimensional uh, objects. So uh, these kind of methods has nice theoretical properties and they also converge faster than steepest descent. But these all fall under the umbrella of uh, we are computing all these gradients and we are throwing it away in steepest descent. Can we use those gradient information to do something better than steepest descent? So yeah. The step size, exactly. So without really figuring out what alpha k should be, this is automatically figuring out alpha k for you. Same thing here, it's automatically figuring out alpha k for you. So, because if your function f is complicated, coming up with the best alpha k that will converge faster is also a big problem. You can't use Armijo's rule, you can't use constant step size, so you need to do something better. And so these are that better algorithms. Okay, so that's all uh, for today. Thank you so much and I'll see you guys on uh, Wednesday. <laughs>